Maxi Seneca Valley as well as Green Mountain. There's also a cultivar called Green Velvet, and I believe that was bred by Sheridan's as well. The principal difference between Green Mountain and Green Velvet is that if we were to uh, not prune Green Mountain, it would be a little more pyramidal, like Green Mountain. Mm. And green velvet has duller leaves, so you really need the two side by side growing unadulterated to, to be able to tell the difference. So we're looking principally at Green Mountain. This is also the one that we have in the Cuddy Gardens. If you go to the lower garden, that's the garden with the pergola in the center. There are four or more boxwood that anchor on the clues. Those are Green Mountain, and those are clipped every year as well to clip to maintain that pyramidal form. So, you can see again some of the breeding in this. It's got the orange undersides, that's the winter color that will disappear. And dark green leaves and kind of a broad spreading form with mountain being a little more pyramidal than green velvet. They are, I don't know if Jack's brought in, um, in your plant pathology, your IPM course. Have you brought in any boxwood? So what's the... What's What's the pest? <laughs> yeah. Boxwood syphilid. Right, so what, what, I know it sounds like syphilis, but no, syphilis. Um, little minor, and it's been a huge problem in the last few years. It was a huge problem this spring in the Cuddy Garden. All of last year's growth was severely infested. So what we did is we clipped it back beyond that. So we gave each of the plants a massive pruning because we don't spray and we can't spray. Uh, we pruned it out. So to really clip the plant, took those clippings and put them into the burn pile to kind of at least break the life cycle. I use boxwood quite a bit because I like it. It's a, it's a fairly tough plant. You can prune it very easily. So uh, if you go to Versailles, have they been to Versailles? Big Palace. Sue, Sue Miller will talk about that in your garden history class. Anyhow, if you want to see boxwood that's clipped, it's been clipped for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, acres and acres and acres and acres of it, then it's the Palace of Versailles. So it responds very well to clipping and pruning and shearing. And uh, it lends itself to topiary, uh, cut into shapes and such. If you go down to uh, Disney, You'll see a lot of that sort of stuff. They don't necessarily use boxwood there because it's too long, but you'll get the idea. And we can do the same thing here if we wanted to. We can do the same with the taxes as well. So it lends itself to clipping. It can be formal or informal. Here we're using it as informal. I've got uh, formal hedges. Hey, someone's got the falcos there. Um, I've got formal hedges along the side of my walkways going to the front of my house. So you can use it in an informal formal situation. It is not at all salt tolerant. If we, now we've got positive drainage here, but let's say the rock ray was changed and the rock drained off into this plant, it would be dead, the salt that they put down here. In case of point, I was away in 2006, seven from my house. I had someone staying there, they salted the front rock ray. I came back and where the walkway drained off to one side, a chunk of the boxwood hedge was completely brown, completely toasted. So it's not at all salt tolerant. Like fairly rich, my soil will tolerate partial shade to full sun. So it's got some specific cultural considerations. Any questions? Yes, sir. Is the uh, leaf pointer less of a nuisance than boxwood white? Uh, well, boxwood blight now has become a huge, huge problem. Good point. Um, to the point that uh, uh, Hiller Nurseries, you, did you go to Hiller Nurseries? Yeah, so the, the year before you went there, I stopped in one day um, because we buy some stuff from them, and they have foot baths and, and, and no entry behind, beyond this point, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm surprised that when you guys went there, they didn't make you go through a foot bath. They did? Oh, they did, okay. And we did at Downham's too, right? I think we only did it at Downham's. I don't think we did it at Hillens. We were in the building. 
And you know why, Zara? Because Downham's brought in the boxwood blight. And then uh, there's, there's quite a controversy going on with it, you know, the politics of the local nursery business. Downham's brought in infected plants, knew that they were infected, um, dumped them at the back of one of the farms and were going to burn them, but then some of the employees began to sell them off before they could burn them. And one of the ladies that works for Peter Hill, and it was one of her husbands, called Peter this, and Peter this one. Yeah, it's because he was growing probably, I don't know, 200,000 of these things, right, at about five to six bucks a pop. So, you know, half a million, three quarters of a million dollars potential loss for him. And the fact now that they had an infected area and quarantines, et cetera, et cetera. So it would be a big problem for us if we got it here because we use a lot of them. I use a lot of them in, you know, a lot of them in cutties and gardens, etc. And it would mean a pretty quick, drastic change for replacing those plants. And one of the reasons I use them is I like the, the evergreen informality in the winter, like Canadian landscapes are pretty boring, with the exception of this campus, which is, you know, really interesting. There's a lot going on. Like, if you walk through the conifer garden, you would have seen that. Like, look here, look at how the plants are mixed in with the perennials and such, which you don't see a lot of. We have to go and look at... Uh